Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining this talk today. I'm going to be talking about uh, confidential virtual machines and remote attestation, how you can use remote attestation to establish a route of trust using a VTPM and, and the firmware. Um, I did go for trying to get the longest title possible, if you look at the, uh, the agenda, but I couldn't fit it on my slides. I had to cut it down a little bit. But what I'm trying to aim to do is actually attract so many people with, with buzzwords about confidential computing. Um, we are going to cover a lot of ground today. I've got a lot of slides. I'm hoping I'm going to fit it in. Uh, the bonus is I thought I was getting a half-hour slot, but it turns out it's 45 minutes, so lucky you. You got an extra couple of slides that I put in last night. Um, quick intro to me, because I, I don't think most of you have met me before. I've only been at SUSE for just over a year now. I think I joined about two weeks before the last labs conference. So I was here, but didn't know anybody. Um, I work in the labs core kernel team, uh, but actually I spend most of my time not on the kernel, but in the confidential computing stack. Um, so I work on Coconut SVSM. I spend a lot of my time there. We're going to look at that a little bit today. Uh, but not in a huge amount of detail. Uh, and um, I'm doing some work on integrating some confidential computing firmware loading capability in, into to QMU. Um, I have a long background in data protection, the last 15, 18 years or so, um, mostly in full disk encryption. There's been some great full disk encryption talks and secure boot talks uh, over the last couple of days that are helping me along in what I'm doing here. Um, uh, and that actually gave me the opportunity to experience trusted execution environments and confidential computing from the very early days. And so I'm quite opinionated about it. I have my own views on what's going on. I'm particularly keen on attestation, which is why I'm doing a talk on attestation today. Um, so what we're going to do is start uh, with a brief introduction of con uh, confidential virtual machines. Just quickly, how many of you, I'm not going to ask anyone, but how many of you think you know what a confidential virtual machine is at quite a technical level? That's good. I think hopefully I'm pitching this correctly then. So um, I will go for a very quick overview. So it's basically um, a, a confidential virtual machine uses hardware-based security um, to isolate guest memory and context from, uh, from the host. Uh, and they do this using um, hardware that provides a per VM key, normally a per VM key, um, that every time the guest has started, it gets a different key um, for the memory context. Uh, and it can also provide integrity protection as well for the memory and state. So what this means is it is isolating the ability to manipulate the, the guest, what it's doing, what it's processing, what it can see from the host and any external attackers coming in. Um, but the, the problem with this is that it's all very well that you're, you're sending your workload off to a, a server in the cloud somewhere or a server on an on-prem uh, uh, office. Um, how do you know that it's actually running inside that confidential environment? You know, if, if I had my guest configuration here and I said to, to Vassan, please can you go and run that in a virtual machine somewhere? And he said, yeah, that's fine. It's in a confidential virtual machine. How do we know he's actually done that? And that's what the remote attestation part is for. Um, and so the remote attestation can then be used to establish that root of trust that builds the, the trust foundation in the guest. Um, when it comes to attestation, there's not many terms, but they all seem to have overlapping or slightly different meanings. Um, so what I've done is I'm, I'm going to try my best to use these consistently throughout the rest of this talk. Um, and uh, I, I won't say that these are the official definitions of these terms, but the ones I'm going to use. Um, so we start off with a trusted execution environment. Uh, so a trusted execution environment is basically an instance of a confidential computing platform. So you start off with a server that supports something like SEVSNP, and the trusted execution environment is, is the mode of operation of the CPU when it's actually running in the context of a, a, a protected guest. Um, for Intel SGX, it's the context in which uh, an, an SGX enclave runs. Um, an attestation report is a statement from the trusted execution environment itself that gives some context about the security posture of the, the operating environment, of the trusted execution environment. Uh, and generally, that gives um, version numbers of the, the, the firmware that implements the, the um, uh, the trusted execution environment, but it also gives some indication about what is running inside the trusted execution uh, environment itself, so the workload that's running in there. Um, importantly, that's generally signed by the, the, the TEE, um, so it can be verified that it is actually running on uh, actual hardware. 
Um, attestation, um, obviously an important term here. Um, attestation is the, uh, the operation that takes place by a relying party, which we'll talk about in a minute, by, um, to, to actually prove that an attestation report is genuine, and then to use the information within that report to determine whether, to, whether or not to trust a guest. Um, so I've got an example there. The guest uses attestation to securely retrieve the keys for the encrypted disk. Remote attestation is the same as attestation, but it's done not on the server platform. There, there is the counter to that, which is local attestation, and that happens between uh, different um, trusted execution environments running on the same server platform. So remote attestation is more what we're interested in here, which is the ability to prove to a third party or to an external party that um, a guest is trustworthy. And then the relying party, the final one here, is the entity that uses that attestation report and the remote attestation process in order to gain trust in the guest. And the key broker service is a good example of that, so requiring a, an attestation report to establish trust in the guest. So, you know, launching a confidential guest um, is not that much, it's not that dissimilar to launching a, a, a normal, say, KVM guest. Um, there are a few other entities in play and operations that need to be performed, though. Um, what I'll do first of all, so, so this is going to be the process for AMD, SEV, SMP, um, and I'm going to shorten that to SEV because I can't say that every time. So when I talk about SEV, I mean the latest generation of SEV, which is SEV, SMP. Um, now, the process for TDX and um, the other confidential computing platforms on non-X86 is going to be similar to this. Um, I don't know exactly how they work, and I did try and make this general purpose, but it, it just blew out into too many slides. Um, so we're going to just concentrate on SEV. Um, the thing with SEV is that they include this thing called the security processor. Now, that is a, like an embedded processor that's sitting on the same silicon as the CPU itself. Um, it can be updatable with firmware, um, and um, it, it is basically its job is to provide all of the cryptographic operations, the key management, and other security-related operations that are required to implement SEV on on the um, uh, on an Epic CPU. And so that basically is in control of what happens on these guests. Um, so what you do is you start off with a guest configuration, which is generally your firmware, something like OVMF. Uh, example I've got there's got some other things in there as well. Um, and then you um, pass that as parameters to, to QMU along with your disk image, et cetera. Um, and then the hypervisor will then start assembling the guest um, uh, the guest memory image and, and context. Um, what happens there is that the, the hypervisor, QMU KVM, will tell the security processor that we're creating a new confidential virtual machine. Uh, and that has the effect of the uh, security processor generating what's called a guest context. Now, that lives in a page of um, memory donated by the hypervisor, but not accessible by the hypervisor or, or, the, or the guest, in fact. It's only accessible by the security processor itself. Um, and that contains the state about the guest as it's launching. Um, and that includes this thing called the launch digest. Now, that, that's important because what happens is as we configure each page of OVMF that's going to be added to the guest, um, the security processor will um, take that page of memory, uh, and it's always a 4K page, even if it was uh, specified in two megabyte pages or, or differently, um, and it will encrypt that page, um, and then it will also measure that page using a hashing algorithm. Uh, and it will update the launch digest in that guest context. So that will continue until we've finished configuring the guest. Uh, one of the other things that's in there is the initial state. So with, with SEV, um, SMP, I will say it this time, with SEV, SNP, um, you can specify the initial state of the CPU. So you can actually launch it in 32-bit mode or 64-bit mode if you wanted to. Um, so obviously that could change the entry point for the guest. So that needs to be measured as well. So the security processor measures that and adds that to the launch digest in that launch context. So when that configuration is finished, um, there's a launch finish uh, IOC tool, which is called, which then um, results in the security processor transitioning that guest context into a ready to launch state. And at that point, the launch digest is fixed. Um, so what we've ended up there with is a measurement, which as long as the guest is always initialized in the same way, will be repeatable on every boot cycle. Okay, so. Um, next step is that the, the guest is launched as normal. Uh, the guest starts running. 
Um, and then you know the it, it boots through through OVMF, uh, UFI, through to an operating system. Um, at any point of that launch process, the guest is able to request an attestation report, or it might choose to request an attestation report. Um, and it can't talk to the security processor directly. There's no uh, direct path in there. Um, so what happens is it has to go via the hypervisor. But of course, we're, we're trying not to trust the hypervisor. Um, so as part of the, um, uh, the configuration, uh, uh, when, when the hypervisor is, is configuring the security processor, one of the pages that, that's allocated to the guest is called a secrets page. And as the guest is launched, the security processor will populate that secrets page with an encryption key that's only shared between the security processor and the guest. Uh, and that can be then used to encrypt requests and messages to the security process from the guest via the hypervisor and the response coming back again. Of course, the hypervisor could choose not to deliver them, so there is a denial of service attack that could still take place, but that would be pretty apparent if you're trying to request an attestation report and it never happens. Um, so the guest requests that um, attestation report from the security processor. The security processor assembles all the information about itself, the trusted execution environment as a whole, but also some information out of that guest context, such as the launch digest. It then signs that using an attestation key um, and then sends that securely back to the guest. And the guest at that point will decrypt the response. It has an attestation report, which it can then, if it wants to, send off to a relying party to, to maybe gain access to some secret information. So, you know, it, it's a fairly straightforward process, really, to get to that point. There's obviously a lot more to it than I'm talking about there, but um, to actually um, measure the startup and get an attestation report with that uh, signed measurement in it is 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 relatively straightforward from a certainly from a user perspective. Um, so I talked about signing the attestation report, but um, you know. When you talk about signing something, you need to trust the signing key. Otherwise, what's the point in signing it? Um, now, the key that's used to sign uh, the attestation report needs to prove it's coming from a genuine EPIC processor, in the case of SEV, um, which means it needs to be unique for that processor. Um, and so if we look at how that, that key is generated, so when the CPU is manufactured, um, a chip unique secret is provisioned. Um, I, I don't know. Part of this is speculation, by the way. I don't think this is public information, but you know, it has to work this way, really. Uh, a chip unique secret is provisioned um, and then burnt into the cryptographic fuses on the silicon itself. Um, and also, AMD has a copy of that chip unique secret. And now, this is, is, is used for verifying attestation reports. So that, that's what AMD has basically the secret information for here. Um, and then, the, we don't actually use that chip unique secret directly to sign the attestation key. We use a key that's derived from that. Um, and the key that's used is derived from a, a, a number of different things, um, but it's um, things like the microcode patch level of the CPU itself, um, the security processor, software version number, because these are all upgradable components. So if there's a, a security vulnerability found in, in uh, the security processor firmware, for example, um, I don't know if that's ever been the case. Uh, certainly Intel's had issues of SGX that have required security version number increments. Um, but if that's the case, then what happens is you get a new key out of that. Um, which means that if you have a compromised firmware and it tries to lie about the attestation level, you know, the, the, the version numbers in the report, it would be signed with a key from a previous version. Um, so there's a, a, a way there of ensuring that if there's any requirement to change the security version number, you get a new key and you've got forward security going on there. So it's important to note here that the, the CPU has all of the information to generate this, this um, signing key. Oh, it's called the version chip endorsement key, by the way, the VCheck. Um, the chip itself can generate that, but also AMD has exactly the same information to be able to generate that. And that's important for the next step. So, so now we know we've got a, a version key, we need to gain tr trust in that key. So AMD can tell us that. Um, but it would be quite expensive to every time we wanted to check if um, an attestation report is valid, we send that attestation report off to AMD and they say, yes, that's valid, or no, it's not, or, or whatever. So they provide an infrastructure to be able to, to delegate that task, and they do that through generating certificates. So AMD provide uh, a KDS, um, and it has an endpoint which takes 
a, a chip ID, not the chip secret, a chip ID, a unique chip ID uh, as a, uh, a parameter, along with the version number you are requesting um, a certificate for. And what we're obtaining here is a certificate, a signed certificate of the public key of a particular VCheck for a specific CPU. Um, and so when you make that request, um, the KDS will go and retrieve the chip unique secret um, and I, I guess it will check, and this is again speculation, that the, the firmware has been applied to that particular part and it's, it's a valid configuration. And then it will derive the VCheck um, and then it will um, uh, take the public key and it will sign that using the certificate chain here. So the AMD SEV signing key, which itself is then signed by the AMD root key. And then what's returned from the KDS is a certificate rooted with AMD that proves that um, a particular VCheck public key is valid. And so once you have that public key, you can then look at your attestation report and say, yes, that public key corresponds with the one that's used to sign this report, so you know it has been signed with a valid trusted execution environment. So that's good. But all that tells us is that the report itself is valid. It doesn't tell us whether we should trust the guest. Um, because maybe the, the guest firmware is out of date or the, um, you know, the, the actual software that's running inside that guest is not what we expect it to be. Uh, or one thing I should do on the terms, I didn't mention this one. Um, there's um, two different terms for firmware here. Firmware generally for us refers to what's on a BIOS chip. It's a, the UEFI component or OVMF. Um, in terms of SEV, the firmware corresponds to the initial software that is, is loaded onto a guest during the initialization phase before the launch measurement is taken and before it's started. And as soon as it's started, the firmware is clamped down. That normally is OVMF, but it can also include other components such as the SVSM as well. Uh, but anyway, back to the attestation report. Um, so the attestation report, as I said, you need to look at the contents of it before you can trust the guest. Um, it's massive, it's a, there's a load of fields in this report. Um, I only want to call out a couple of them here, uh, and probably most, most of these are, are, are not what we want to look at today. Um, but the important ones are the measurement, so it's pretty obvious what that's going to be. That's the measurement that was calculated during guest launch in the guest context. Um, so that's put into the attestation report. Um, the, I just talked about the firmware, so um, the, the guest that, that created the guest image that's loaded onto the, um, the confidential virtual machine, they can ver you know, have their own version numbering scheme if they want to. It's, it's a freeform versioning number that can also be embedded into the, the attestation report as well. Um, one really important one that's worth mentioning is the report data field. Um, because if you think about it, if you've got an attestation report and you send that to a a relying party, such as a, a key broker service. Um, the key broker service can then look at that report and it can say, okay, the report's valid. I trust the measurement that's in that report, so I know what software version's working on there. I know what version the trusted execution environment is and the, that I'm happy with that. Okay, I've got a key to give back to it. How do I give that key back to the guest? You know, what we need to do is establish a secure communication channel between the guest and, uh, and the service that is the relying party, basically. Uh, and the report data fields for that. Generally, what you put in that report data field is it's 512 bits of um, guest information. The guest can provide anything they want to, and it gets signed by the trusted execution environment saying it came from the guest. Normally, what you would put in there is either a, um, a public key from a, a, a a public-private key pair that's generated in the guest, which is used for communication. Or if you want to provide some more information, some context around it, or some authentication to a key for, for a key, for example, then you can actually create a structure containing all of your information and then put the hash of that structure in the report data so you can verify the integrity once it reaches the other end. Um, and then the relying party, when it is ready to send the data back, it then uses the report data to find the public key to encrypt the data then to then send back to the guest. And then it knows that only the guest should be able to decrypt that because it trusts the software and the guest at this point. Right, where are we now? Um, so, so this is the ones I added yesterday uh, as a bonus slide. Um, one of the things that's important to get right when you want to trust the initial firmware that's in a guest image, in, in a guest that's running, uh, to get the correct measurement, is to be able to consistently provide the measurement of the guest itself. Um, 
so it, it, imagine if in a normal um, QMU guest configuration, what you would do is you'd provide maybe the BIOS parameter with, with a UFI firmware or maybe some flash drives with the firmware on it. It's entirely up to QMU as to how it then, what order it, it picks up those files, how it populates the guest, and what it does with those. You will end up with probably a, a, you know, a consistent image each time you do it, but you don't know what order it's going to do it in. So Microsoft came up with the, this new file format called the Independent Guest Virtual Machine Format. And this takes the ambiguity out of um, uh, configuring the memory state and initial state of, of guests. Um, and it's just basically another way of packaging firmware plus some other context. Um, and so what you do is you, you um, take whatever you want to populate into guest memory and you construct a set of directives such as all of these page data directives I've got on the, the left here. Um, and um, the IGVM file, um, in, you know, if you have an impl implementation in QMU that loads one of these, what it needs to do is actually process those in the order they're specified. And if you do that and you provide, uh, consistently um, process the data that comes in from the IGVM file, then you should result in uh, an exact same measurement regardless of what version of QMU you're using or whether you're using a different hypervisor altogether. Um, there are some complexities involved in that, which I don't need to go into here, and this is you know, a new format that's evolving. Uh, and one of the jobs that I'm doing at the moment is, is um, uh, trying to get initial IGVM support for QMU upstream. Um, so I'm on version, about to issue version three of the patch set for that. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's an important tool when you're, when you're looking at confidential guests and know that you, know, you have to have a way to consistently configure the guests to get a consistent measurement. Um, so, you know, I, I work as part of Coconut SVSM and we are committed to using IGVM at the moment for configuring the initial firmware in confidential guests for SEV, but also it's going to be used for TDX as well and potentially others. Um, so as part of that, we've developed some tools to work with this. So if you ever find yourself experimenting with this, it's worth looking, even if you're not going to use the SVSM, looking for the tools there. So we have a, a tool that can package up an IGVM file with, with OVMF and the SVSM and potentially other things. Um, but there's also another tool there which um, can measure the contents of the IGVM file. Um, and, you know, now that's quite important. What's my next slide? I expected launch measurement. Um, so yeah, and measuring the IGVM file is, um, offline is actually quite an important process because, okay, so when the guest starts up, it results in a measurement. How do you know that measurement's right? Obviously, you can run it in a trusted environment, um, take that measurement the first time you run it and say, okay, I'm just gonna check it never changes again. Um, that's not really ideal um, because you know, the, the actual um, trusted computing base of that is quite high. It's, you know, it's much better to actually follow the process that the security process uses to calculate the launch measurement and then expect that to be the case once you deploy it into a confidential guest. Um, so the IGVM measure uh, tool is, is a way to do that. So once you've created your file, you can run the IGVM measure tool on it, it will spit out a launch measurement, and then that should be what you see in your attestation report once you've loaded this in a guest. Um, so this is the process that SEV uses for calculating the measurement. Um, so again, we're talking with uh, IGVM files. It has, doesn't have to use an IGVM file, but it's a convenient way to think about it. Um, so you start off with a SHA-384 digest, um, which is all zeros. So 48 bytes of zeros. Uh, and then you, you find the first page that's going to be populated into guest memory, and you populate a page info structure uh, to represent that page. And I've got a, a, an extract of that here. Um, so the important fields, digest current, so you put the current value of your launch digest in there, which starts off as zeros. Um, and then you take the contents of the page that you're going to populate into the guest memory, and you take the SHA-384 digest of that, and you put those 48 bytes into the contents field. Um, there's a page type there. Um, so the normal page type is just, a, as it sounds, a normal page of, of, of bytes, 4K page. VMSA, the virtual machine safe states area. So that's where you see the, um, uh, the initial guest context being measured because you specify a VMSA page of a particular location. And there's a couple of others there. Um, and then you say where it's going to appear in the guest physical address range. And once you've populated that structure, you take yet another SHA-384 hash, uh, of the bytes of the structure itself. And the resulting digest that, that comes out of that is the new launch digest. And if you look on the, the flowchart, you just then keep going round 
until you've processed every page in that IGVM file. There are a couple of other fields that can influence the measurement as well. It's not just pages, but it's mostly pages. Um, and then once you've run out of pages, it, it pops out on the right there, and the LD, uh, the digest that comes out of that, is the expected launch measurement when your guest is launched. And you should see, if you load that IGVM file into a guest that's configured correctly, then your attestation report should match that launch measurement. So now that we know, as the, the build server or, or the person, the entity that assembled the guest image with firmware, they can pre-calculate the guest measurement, and then you can pass that to a relying party to say, look, you know, this is the version of software that should be running in the guest. If it matches that launch measurement, then you know it is. Uh, and they can then use that in a policy to determine whether to trust the guest or not. Now, there's an extra little stage there. Um, so um, what you can do is you can actually create a metadata block called an ID block um, that has that expected launch measurement in there and embed that in the IGVM file. Um, and then you can provide that to the security process or the host can provide that to the security processor when the guest is started. Now, it doesn't just contain the ID block. It also contains a signature over the ID block and the hash of the public key that's used to, to create that signature. And there's also another level of key in there as well, which is, is, is for um, uh, ju just for uh, easing the certificate management. Um, and um, what that is, this ID block can be applied, as I said, to the security processor by the host when it's started. And then the security processor will abort the launch of the guest if the launch measurement doesn't match or if the signature over the launch measurement is invalid, so if it's been tampered with or anything in the IGVM file has been tampered with. Now, you may say, well, that's not much use because we don't trust the host, so what's the point of that? But the important part there really is that the fact that the information from the LD block, sorry, the ID, uh, the ID block is also embedded in the attestation reports in some fields I didn't show. Um, so you can actually check that um, an ID block was provided and you can see the hash of the public key. So as a relying party, rather than having a big database of all of the launch measurements that you trust, um, what you could do instead is trust a, um, you know, a, a, a trusted build environment or, or, or a third party to say that, as, as, you know, I have a certificate from company ABC, and it, they were, if, if they signed my um, ID block that's in the attestation report, then I trust the software that comes out of it. So it makes it much easier to... Uh, handle incremental upgrades to, to the firmware that's running inside the guest. Right, how am I doing for time? Um, okay, so we've looked in detail about what the attestation report tells us, and what we have actually done now is establish trust in the initial code that runs in the guest, the firmware. Um, so we have a, a, a UEFI image that's trusted, like we do on a bare metal platform. Um, normally. Um, but what we haven't talked about is what happens after that. Um, now, generally what happens after that comes from an attached disk on the guest um, or some other you know, configuration. Uh, and we can't trust that at all because you could swap that disk out, somebody could edit that disk image. Um, good news is this is a known problem uh, and it's already been talked about in a, in a few talks like um, uh, uh, the talk this morning on, on the state of um, uh, disk encryption covered how you actually gain trust in, in what happens after this. And that's called secure boot and or measured boot. Um, so if you look at what we've got, so we start with a trusted AVMF. And because it's trusted, we can um, uh, the firmware could have embedded certificates in that or a set of UEFI variables that actually define the, the UEFI secure boot policy. Uh, so we can then look at the stub and say, look, does it meet our policy? If no, we abort the boot at that point. If yes, then we continue the boot. Uh, the stub.efi comes with its own certificates that then trust the grub, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, alongside that, um, or maybe alternatively to that, we have measured boot as well. And what this does is we, again, starting from the, rust, uh, the trusted route, um, the trusted route before it executes stub.efi will take a cryptographic measurement of the, um, the, uh, the process itself. Um, and um, that gets measured uh, and extends the PCR registers in the TPM. Now, there was a talk about that this morning, so I won't go into all of the details of PCRs and I haven't got time to. But basically, those registers maintain a, um, a set of hashes that update depending on uh, what is happening in the boot process. So it could be 
based on the, the firmware images, the, the UEFI images, or the, even the, um, uh, the parameters that were selected on a boot menu. And what you end up with at some point is a set of PCR registers that reflect the exact boot state of the system. And you can use that, uh, the PCR registers, to then specify a policy which um, seals an encryption key, um, which can then be used to unlock a, an encrypted disk. So what that means is that you know that if any of those components after our trusted routes change, you get a different set of PCR registers, which means the disk can't be unlocked, so you maintain integrity from the disk onwards as well. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, and as I said, there were talks this morning that go into a lot more detail. But, but for our purposes, we can say that if we can provide a trusted route with a TPM, then we can have solutions for then trusting the, the, the guest beyond what the attestation tells us. So that tells us we need a TPM. Um, bad news is we don't have one. Um, so you, um, there is not a standard way of having a, a virtual TPM in a, a confidential virtual machine. So you have to um, either gain access to a physical one or you have to emulate one. Um, so before I go into that though, let's have a look at what we need from our TPM. Um, so you need to have PCRs that are initialized consistently to a known state on every boot of the guest. And you need to know that they can only be extended. They can only move forwards. They can never move backwards unless the guest is physically reset. Um, because if you can reset the TPM back to zeros, a malicious component can reset it and then replay whatever state it wants into it and lie about the, the actual state of the system. Um, and the other thing that the TPM needs to be able to do is, is uh, seal keys. It needs to be able to have some sort of way to persistently uh, keep a key safe over uh, reboots and potentially even migrating to another server platform. So let's look at where we can implement this. Um, we could try putting it in the hypervisor, um, so emulating a TPM in the hypervisor, but that's no good because the hypervisor can reset the state of that TPM at a minimum, um, and we don't want the, tr the hypervisor in uh, our trusted computing base with these confidential virtual machines. So let's look at the guest. Um, now, putting it in the guest, especially as it's a confidential virtual machine, means the hypervisor can't tamper with it. That's great. Um, but what about, uh, let's say, you know, uh, OVMF is measured, so that's okay, but when OVMF launches stub, um, the stub could be a malicious stub that goes and, and uh, you know, it's, it's already running in, in CPL0 at that point, so it could access the state of the TPM and reset it. Um, so any vulnerabilities in the stub, for example, could then you know, basically break that platform. So that's no good either. So what we need to do is actually look at a third option that we haven't talked about so far, and that's by using something else that a confidential computing platform can give us, and that's virtual machine privilege levels. Now, these are privilege levels that are independent of the CPL levels on the CPU. So you can have a, a high privilege level VMPL0 in this case here, um, which has a kernel and a user space component. And you can have a VMPL2 that also has a uh, kernel and user space component. And by putting some sort of VTPM into the higher privilege level inside the guest, and then switching to a lower privilege level before you run OVMF and before you run UFI firmware and the rest of the guest, it means that you can isolate uh, the VTPM memory code and execution from the remainder of the guest. It's almost like a mini, mini TE that's running inside the TE itself. So this is where Coconut SVSM comes in. And I'm not going to go into the details of this because it's far bigger than this talk. Um, but for our purposes, um, well, this is from the GitHub site. It says, provide secure services and device emulations to guest operating systems in confidential virtual machines. Um, for our purposes, what it does is it provides us with a kernel in which we can implement a, a, a virtualized hardware device, a VTPM in this case, um, which is separated via the privilege levels from the remainder of the guest execution. So Coconut SVSM is, you saw it on my first IGVM uh, guest configuration page. It's deployed along with OVMF as part of the initial guest image in the IGVM file, which means that it is measured during the boot process which means it's in the attestation report. So that tells us that you know, the, the integrity of that software is, is protected, which means we should be able to establish trust in the SPSM as well as the, the resulting UFI that runs 
after that. Uh, TPM is also part of, deployed as part of SCSM, so that's also measured as part of that as well. So now we can implement a trusted TPM uh, as part of the, the guest firmware. Right, so, um, so does that solve the problem? Um, not quite. Um, looking back at those requirements that I put up there, it does solve the PCR problem because now we have a, a host that cannot manipulate the TPM, it's on a confidential guest, and we have VMPL2 code, um, trusted at first but becomes untrusted, um, which also can't manipulate the VTPM because it's in a lower privilege level. Um, we can trust the coconut SVSM not to do it because we've audited that code and we've trusted that code. Um, so that bit's fine. Um, the next problem is though, the secrets. Um, so we need to be able to persistently unwrap a disk encryption key, for example. Um, so we need some way to store that encryption key. So regardless of what host it's running on, uh, it could be migrated to another platform. If those PCR registers don't change, we can unwrap the same key uh, because obviously the disk key is not going to change. Um, one way to solve that um, is to actually, rather than trying to have a persistent solution that's secured with some sort of encryption key on the guest itself, because um, that would obviously have to be um, attached to the host, is to actually delegate that to an external service. Now, this is where our attestation uh, report comes in. So all of that work we've done on the attestation report, this is why it's important. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use that attestation report as evidence to show that we are entitled to obtain the root keys to manufacture that VTPM. Um, so going back to the uh, sort of the original flow from initializing our guest, we still initialize our guest with SVSM in this, this case, including TPM, OVMF, results in a launch digest. We've already covered that part. Um, now the guest starts up, um, it starts up in the SVSM kernel at VMPL0, and the SVSM says, okay, I need to manufacture my TPM now in order to get a consistent root key. Um, so it goes and gets an attestation report, so it can then give that as evidence to a key broker service. Now, generally, um, it doesn't talk to the key broker service directly. Uh, I, I don't mean in terms of a physical transport layer. I mean, it, do, it doesn't um, send the attestation report to a key broker service. It will enlist the help of a, another service called an attestation service. Uh, and the job of the attestation service is to understand attestation reports from different versions of uh, trusted execution environments and also different confidential computing platforms such as ARMS platform, TDX, TPMs themselves, anything else, and it will um, it knows how to validate those reports or ver yeah, validate those reports against the, the root trust. Um, so it will use the AMD KBS to get the certificate and validate the report itself. If the attestation report is valid, it then applies a transformation to the contents of that report and turns it generally into claims on a JSON web token. Uh, and by turning it into a, a signed token, signed by the attestation service itself, um, that can be used as evidence for services that don't really understand what attestation is, uh, which is quite useful when you want to specify a key policy. So um, our uh, SVSM will send via the hypervisor somehow um, the attestation report to an attestation service. There's probably a broker involved here. Um, the attestation service will validate that report, generate the token. That token will then get forwarded to a key broker service. We've already provisioned our key in the key broker service. Uh, we specified a policy in there that says only trust um, a token that says that it's coming from a, an AMD SEV SMP uh, trusted execution environment running with this patch level or above um, with uh, this version of the software running as the firmware in that platform. So a policy could look like that. Um, so the attestation token is passed to the key broker service that then checks it trusts the attestation service, of course. Um, it will then check the token itself against the key policy, and then it will encrypt the key if it meets the policy and send it back to the guest. Now, the encryption key, uh, so it encrypts the key. I say that it's, it's wrapping the VTPM secrets. Now, we go back to the report data and the attestation report. So the attestation service has taken out that report data, and it's turned that into um, a claim on the token that says, if you want to reply to the guest once you trust it, here's a public key that you can use to do that. Um, so that wraps that key using a key wrapping algorithm. It gets sent back to the SVSM. The SVSM obviously has the corresponding private key to unwrap that. It then takes that key out, and it then uh, manufactures the VTPM. And there you go. We have finally a root of trust in the firmware, 
with a virtual TPM. So that's the whole flow. So that's basically everything. So, um, you know, we've got five minutes. I want to leave a, a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave that there, I think, and, and, and open the floor to questions. So th this is where we are today with all these components. There's loads of parts, moving parts of this. Most of this is not quite ready, but it does all work. Um, and we have POCs, so you know, I created for my, my Hack Creek project last year, I actually did exactly that flow I talked about there, and others as well outside of SUSE have also done that. Um, but there is still some work to get this, this all upstream and working. Um, but with that, I'll answer, uh, ask if anyone has any questions for me. <laughs> Yeah, that was a wild ride, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, the big yeah. thing seems to be that I have to trust AMD. So yes. they have the keys. And I mean, I understand why this is currently the case, but are there any developments of maybe changing that, of saying, well, you can enroll your own keys there? Yeah, yeah. So if I go back to, now I, I only know the very basics of how this works. Um, but if you look, there's a signing key field on the attestation report. Um, and there's the VCheck that I talked about. There's also the option to sign an attestation report with a VLEC. Um, now, this is, I think, from the AMD documentation, this is designed for cloud service providers to have their own, provision their own key that can be used for signing attestation reports. I think, from the, the brief reading I did about this, I think you have to trust both of them in that case. But I'm not sure. So that might be the answer, or it might not. Um, but you have to trust somebody. Uh, and generally, the silicon vendor is, you know, you're, you're running code on AMD silicon. So they're always going to be in the trusted computing base if you're doing that. So, yeah. Um, well, actually, I was going to ask where the keys are stored. But then, as you explained, well, you just de declared it away, not your problem. Someone else to do with that. <laughs> the whole thing is about trust, because you're essentially not trusting anybody. But then you say, oh, I don't trust anybody, but those who actually store the really, really critical things, like the actual keys, oh, that'll be fine. Isn't there a mismatch? No, 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 it's not the vendor. I'm not talking about the vendor. If you da, 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 slide the broker thing. Which one? Yeah, that would be us if we would run the machines of uh, somewhere else. We would be our own. So the, the, yeah, the yeah. broker services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the things which I can store your keys. Yeah, this is something we would, should have to run, in my opinion. Like, at the same so. service, the key broker service has to be run on-premise, and you go to the cloud, and you have the keys, and then you, or you trust the cloud. So, or rather, is so there, is there um, an idea to have that included with the hypervisor or the host OS itself, that you don't no. have to go out and um, Well, no, because where would you store it? The, the, the whole point is that you're, you're actually storing this um, on, in a trusted environment, and, and you don't trust the server environment, so it couldn't be on the host. So, yeah, uh, and but, it can't be but the then if you, if you can't trust the host, why can't you can't trust the key broker? Because the key broker could be like an on-prem service. It could be an HSM that's uh, auditable. Um, it's, it's moving the trust somewhere else. Exactly. And, um, so again, coming back to my, how, why do you trust them? Because, because you, run you, it might, you might own that. In the same way that you own the guest image and you own the, the policies to be able to determine whether you trust the guest or not, you can also own the key service. But you're delegating the computation onto an untrusted platform. No, you're delegating the trust of the key to the key broker. You have to trust them. Yeah, but you, you trust that key broker because you are the key broker, is what I'm saying. You can become the key broker yourself. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, my question would be, are there plans? That would be exactly my question. That, that, is that we or someone else builds uh, open source software for attestation service and key broker service to manage routes of trust and uh, compare public keys and certificates. Yeah, so... Uh, I don't know if you saw on that last slide, if we gave you time to read it. Um, yeah, that I saw, and that was Intel uh, and Microsoft Cloud. The bottom one, though, confidential yeah. containers, trusted components. So as part of the Hack Reap project, I, I changed my idea what I was going to do, because I was going to implement a very basic attestation service as a proof of concept. And when I started researching this, I, somebody had already done it. Um, and they've done a very good job of it, as far as I can tell. So this is part of the um, yeah, confidential containers. They, they've 
uh, developed a what was two separate services, an attestation service and the KBS, open, fully open source. Uh, they've now combined it into one service that you can configure into either mode. Uh, and that does, um, uh, I did, haven't got a link for it, but um, that does do that exact job of taking uh, an AMD SCV attestation report and generating a token. And you can self-host that. Um, somebody else could host it for you. Um, obviously, you do need to, again, they would be in the chain of trust in that case, so it's probably something you would choose to, to self-host. Thanks. Any more? We are at time. Um, I'm happy to answer, hang around and answer any more questions if you have them. Or, yeah, so I think that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs> right.